Joffrey Lupul failed his physical by the Maple Leafs yet again, and the NHL ordered an independent exam to be done. Is Lupul in trouble, and did the NHL make the right decision? Also, Ovechkin chose not to go to the Olympics, which is what he was fighting for to begin with. Is this good or bad for Ovechkin? Next, there's a new rule that will be implemented this year that has some people angry. Is their opinion valid? Plus, another look at the Vegas Golden Knights, focusing on their uniforms. Good or bad? Also, Tommy has a new take on the new Adidas jerseys. Does he like them or hate them? Lastly, a look at our top players to watch out for this season. We'll talk all these things today in the Past the Blue Line podcast. I'm your host, Joshua Kessner, and we're talking everything NHL in partnership with Cardinal Sports Live. Uh, I'm your host, Joshua Kessner, as I stated, and today I am with Alicia Barnarcha and Tommy Gruskowski. How are you guys doing today? I'm doing great. Yeah? Yeah, yeah I'm doing good, too. Yeah? Um, all right, so let's uh, let's just jump right into it, shall we? Um, so, big thing, uh, Joffrey Lupul. Um, decent player on the Toronto Maple Leafs, wouldn't you guys say? I think he's a decent player. Um, he failed his physical again, and uh, Joffrey Lupul decided to accuse the Maple Leafs of cheating during this process. Um, I want I want your guys' opinion on this. Was he right or wrong in making this statement? Um, obviously, the NHL ordered an independent exam, and we'll talk about that in a second. But uh, do you think he was right or wrong in this uh, decision? Tommy, we'll start with you. Well, if he's actually healthy, then I'd say he's right. Um, if they're not going to let him play, then, I mean, he's right to accuse them of, you know, cheating the, the process. Um, it's actually stemmed from an Instagram comment. So he made a comment about how the team cheats the physicals, and it's since been deleted, but that's kind of how this all started. Um, but he's been on long-term injury reserve since February of 2016, so he hasn't played for like a year and a half worth of, you know, the hockey season. Um, the big thing with LTIR is that your cap hit doesn't count um, towards the team's salary cap, and he's currently has a $5.25 million cap hit. So with him on LTIR, it gives Maple Leafs $5 million extra dollars to spend on somebody else. Um, so I guess they have some incentive to keep him off the roster if they want to use that money in a different way. I mean, that's not the ethical thing to do. But if that's what they're going at, it's interesting because they had $13 million worth of players on long-term injury reserve last year. So it kind of, you know, makes you question a little bit the process of is he, you know, actually healthy or not? Or are they just doing this for extra cap space? And the, the biggest thing that I took out of this actually was that he was left unprotected in the June expansion draft. So Vegas was free to take him. They didn't, obviously. But there was a rule before the expansion draft that said if a player missed – more than the last year and they weren't expected to come back you know anytime soon they were automatically ineligible for the draft so by that logic he shouldn't even been eligible to be taken but the Leafs left him off there so it's kind of you know a situation that doesn't look great on Toronto um, so now the uh, independent medical exam is going to take place to determine is he healthy enough to play and if you know the independent doctors determine he is I mean that's just a really bad look for Toronto my thing is a lot of athletes they're like yeah I'm okay I'm okay like I want to get back into the game Sometimes there may be like small things that still not may have them there ready to play in the game yet. So I feel like it is extra precautions to take them and have them examined by the NHL. Like I would rather take those precautions than him going down in the game due to a medical emergency. Um, I also think that Toronto may be doing this so they do have that roster spot open because – he clearly hasn't done that much for the team. He hasn't played in over a year and a half. What more does he have to offer? He's played in the NHL for 12 years. It's coming to an end. He's always been in hockey. Maybe he's just afraid that what if this is the end? What am I going to do? He doesn't have that many doors open. So if you're the Toronto Maple Leafs, um, this is an off-topic question a little bit, but if you're the Toronto Maple Leafs and – you decide to keep him. Do you just push him down to the AHL and leave him with the Toronto Marlies? It's a tough situation. I mean, obviously I mean, they could, in theory, do that. Um, a team would have the chance to claim him, whether or not they would. Probably not with that five and a, five and a quarter million dollar uh, cap hit. Yeah, they could do that. I don't think it's the right thing to do from you know an ethical standpoint. I mean, he's been around the organization for a while. You'd think that you know treat him a little better. I mean, I still think he has. He's 34, but I still think he has, you know, 
something to offer. He probably, if you put him in the lineup, you know, opening night next week, he's probably one of their 12 best forwards. I don't think there's any debate about that. So, yeah, yeah. they could, but I, it'd be, I mean, I, I wouldn't if I were them, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Like you said, ethically, I would not think it would be right. Like, he's an experienced player. He is one of their best um, guys. Like, he does have stuff to offer, but it's coming to an end. Like, not everyone is a yager and can play till <laughs> no, no one wants no, to sign him again. No one, <laughs> no, one is, no one is a yager, all right? That's Except yager. <laughs> maybe Timu Solani, but even he's not, he's not yager at that point. Okay, so let's talk about uh, the NHL ordered an independent exam. Um, is this a good move or a bad move for the NHL organization as a whole? I think it's a good move. It shows that they're really caring about the health of their players. They want to take those extra precautions to be safe with these players. Like, they value their health over how much they want to play, even though it may be um, really painful for the player not to play. They want to make sure that the player is okay. Yeah. Yeah, great move. Um, you know, getting a second opinion on the health is one thing, but also making sure teams are actually abiding by the rules is another. I mean, if they were to find out the loophole is healthy and could be playing right now and the Leafs are trying to stick him on long term into reserve and have him sit out the year, I mean, that's a horrible look. You can't really have that going on in your league. So I think it's both double checking the health and making sure, you know, your teams are following the rules. And it's actually uh, Marion Hose has actually had a independent medical exam too with the whole skin condition thing. The results haven't been released yet, but um, basically, the results are the determining factor of whether or not the Blackhawks will be able to put them on long-term injury reserve to start the year. Um, so, yeah, it's actually two cases of that going on this offseason, which is kind of rare. I mean, rare in the sense that you're hearing about it. So, Yeah. Um, it'll be interesting to see what happens uh, out of this independent medical exam. Um, what happens if he fails the exam, uh, if he fails the independent medical exam from the NHL? And he just sits on long-term injury reserve like the plan was for the Leafs all along, and I I guess the whole thing's kind of put to bed for now. Is his career done then? You know, there was talks, like, after he originally got hurt, um, you know, and then going into last year that he probably pl played his last game. So, I mean, those rumors have already been out there. So, yeah, probably. I know, Alicia, you hit on this. You think it's his. He's done, right? I think he's done. Yeah, fair point. Um, so... Um, as always, for those of you listening, it, the key thing is it opens up a roster spot on the Maple Leafs for um, for them. So there might be some incentive for the Maple Leafs to let him go um, or keep him on long-term injury reserve. Okay, uh, let's move on. Let's talk about uh, Alex Ovechkin here. Um, Alex Ovechkin made a big deal when Gary Bettman said, we're not going to go to the Olympics. He started, you know, losing his mind and, uh, you know, getting all angry at Gary Bettman, which I think was rightfully so. He had that he had that right as a player. Now he's not, and now he's saying he's not going to go to the Olympics. Is this good or bad for Ovechkin uh, and the other players who potentially want to go to the Olympics? Um, I know players like Henrik Lundqvist want to go, and some of the big top name players want to go to the Olympics as well and uh, represent their country. Is this good or bad for them as well as for Ovechkin? I think it's their own opinion. Like the but the committees, they already have it in their head that no, we are not going to have like these professional NHL players, and it's kind of sad because you get the World Juniors, you get the NCAA, you get you have beer league like. You have all these other hockey teams and you have the all-star game, but the Olympics is where the best of the best of their country come to play. And it's really sad to not have that. And I know Canada is pretty sad if they can't have their little golden boy on their team this year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, he didn't really have a choice, right? I mean, sure, he could talk all day about, yeah, I'm leaving to go play in the Olympics in February. But, I mean, think about how that looks for him. And, you know, what he's doing in the Capitals. I mean, if he just got up, like he originally said, I'm going, I don't care. You know, February comes around, I'm, I'm going, I'm playing for Russia. That's the end of that. And I, if I remember correctly, the Capitals owner actually, like, supported him. He's like, yeah, like, go for it. But think about that. We're talking about one of the top five players in the league just abandoning his team, captain of his team, leaving for a month to go play in the Olympics midseason. I mean, that's just a bad look. He could talk about, you know, how he wants to be there, and he should want to be there. 
all he wants, but at the end of the day, you can't really leave midseason. Mm-hmm. You just go play in the Olympics. You can't leave the Capitals. You can't leave the NHL. It's a bad look all around. Um, and remember back in 2014, when there was before uh, the Russia Olympics in Sochi, there was talk that the NHL might not go there mm-hmm. um, due to safety concerns. And he said, no, like my home country, Russia, I'm going. I don't care what you guys think. So he kind of he made a big deal about it in 2014, too. Ultimately, NHL ended up going, so it didn't really matter. Um, but star player, cats in the team, you can't just get up. I mean, it's it's good to talk about, like, yeah, I'm going to do this. I'm committed to my country. But you can't just get up and leave for four weeks in the middle of the season. My thing is, like, why is the NHL, like, making a big, big deal about it this year? Like, they made a big deal about going into Sochi, but a lot of these top star players have played, like, the last three Olympics, and they're kind of looking for, they kind of assume that they're going to play these Olympic games, but I don't get why it's such a big deal this year. Like, we've done it in the past. We've had breaks for previous Winter Olympic Games. What's the ruckus now? Yeah. Is it a money deal? Well, like, I think we I, aren't producing games and we aren't making money that way. Well, we can make a pause for the Olympics. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, the big thing was that the, the owners and Batman didn't want to take a break midseason, um, which, I mean, they've done plenty of times before the Olympics. Um, number two is Batman actually claims that the NHL loses money during the Olympics, which is 100% false. There's zero chance they lose money during the Olympics because – not only are you diehard hockey fans tuning in during the Olympics, you're a casual hockey fan or somebody that doesn't even watch hockey any other time of the year is going to watch during the Olympics. There's zero chance they're losing money during the Olympics. That's flat out why. Um, and then um, I think, uh, you know, part of it, it's not really talked about, but, I mean, it's not, they're in South Korea, so it's not like that's cl- close at all. I mean, it's not like we're going back up to Canada like it was Vancouver right. in 2010. I mean, South Korea, that's not anywhere near here. I think that while you didn't hear about it, I think that was a factor also. But another thing that we're trying to do with the NHL is trying to build up a reputation of hockey in Asia. So I think this would be a great opportunity to really get the real star hockey players out there to play in the Olympics. I mean, they just did the preseason games in China, too, last week. I know. But another thing about the Olympics is these kids, you have little kids watching these players. That is how they truly fall in love with the game. They see these all-star players. And then those kids will invest in a player. They invest in a team. I wouldn't have to worry about teams losing money because next thing you know, hey, mom, dad, I need this jersey. I need that. Like, let's play hockey. It's it's not going to do anything to the industry to take a break for a month for the, the Olympics. Well, and I think that one of the things that um, I watched an interview during the Stanley Cup uh, with Gary Bettman, um, and he was talking about the Olympics, and he basically dug himself into a hole because he's <laughs> basically like, well, viewership doesn't go down during the NHL during the World Cup, but why why would it matter during the Stan- or during the uh, Olympics if that's the case? Like, I think he honestly just has a big deal about money. Because he truly does. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I whenever I see Gary Bettman or just hear the name, my heart just kind of I get heartburn and it starts to flutter and I get really angry. <laughs> I'm just really not big fa- I'm not a big fan of him and a lot of people are not a big fan of him. I usually think that he has the money over the passion, over the sport always in his head and it's a really unfortunate thing. Yeah, he's an idiot. Worst commissioner in sports. <laughs> like he makes he makes Roger Goodell look like he's good at his job. So. Right. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. It's I. I think he wants to push all hockey towards the World Cup because he's basically a big proponent of the World Cup. Which I'm not gonna lie. Last year the World Cup was on. I mean, probably mostly because Team USA was terrible in that tournament. Mm-hmm. But I mean, I really just. I didn't really care. Like, I didn't have that much interest in it. Yeah. I watched it, but it wasn't one of those things I was like, oh, can't, you know, yeah. these teams are playing. Like, I didn't, It w- it's more important to me when I watch them during the, during the Olympics. Yeah. So, I can understand, um, you know, players being outraged, obviously, because they get to represent their country on a global stage, not just on a hockey stage. Another thing is a lot of sports, like, even with the Summer Olympics, like, tennis, they, they just got out of, like, a big ATP store stop and like they're still making their way to Rio to play this like why can we kind of take lead and be like we're gonna do this because I know that Ovi's not the only one feeling this way if we get all these star players to really speak their mind and tell Gary to back off we'll see you in South Korea 
Yeah. The problem is, though, it's not, I mean, most of it is him, but it's the owners, too, that True. don't want to take the break. So you're essentially fighting Gary Bettman plus, you know, all 31 yeah. owners at this point. Mm-hmm. Battle, yeah. you're not going to win. It's just not going to happen. Yeah, I can I can understand. It's There's a tie with the owners there, and yeah, I can understand that. Um, okay. Um, so do you think that OV backing out benefits Bettman at all? He's mm. so bad at his job that I don't think anything really has an impact. You know what I'm saying? Like he, Fair. He, he, there's, he's never shown any ability to, like, improve or have any type of positive impact on anything. Like, it's just, everything he does is just terrible. So I don't really think this affects him one way or the other. I mean, he could say, ha, huh, like, I won, but, I mean, did he really win? Because everyone's upset that they're not going anyway. So. Right. I just truly think Ovi's word trumps Batman. Like, you hear how I feel about Gary. His, I don't even want to listen to him. He's irrelevant. Yeah. <laughs> I can understand that. Um, all right. Let's move on. Uh, we hit the, that point pretty well, I think. Yes. Um, let's talk about um, the new rule. Uh, the new rule changes. Um, we're gonna hit on one specific rule. There's a bunch of rules that have got changed, but I want to hit home on one specific rule, um, and that is to the the challenge rule. So the new the new rule is if you challenge offsides and lose the challenge, you get a two minute minor penalty. Um, now the question is. Do you dislike this or like this, uh, and it, why? Um, so let's start with uh, Alicia. Let's start with you this time. I don't really like it, but I do not like hate it. Um, I just think it adds extra precautions to coaches wanting to challenge everything. Um, I find it really rare that a coach even wants to challenge something, but I do not feel the need that there needs to be two minute penalty for challenging something. But before we move on, I need to add, I do need to add this. There's no timeout. Right, you don't need your timeout. Yeah, you you don't need a timeout and you can do it as basically once every play is from what I heard. Um so um you don't like lose a timeout in the process. You just get the minor penalty. All right. I'm actually a fan of this and I was one of the ones that pushed for challenging offsides in the first place cuz I mean, if I go back to 2014, Blackhawks lost Game 7 against the Kings in the Western Conference Final because they couldn't challenge offsides. Um, so I was a big fan of it getting brought in and being allowed to challenge it. I think it's great. But the problem was I felt like last year it was just abused. I felt like anything that was even relatively cl- close to offsides was getting challenged, and then you were stopping play for five minutes so these refs can look at it in an iPad mini you know, <laughs> off to the side and determine if they're offsides or not. And some of these were just so close that you really couldn't tell one way or the other, but they were getting challenged anyway. So I like this because... Not only does it, you know, make you think before you challenge it, you don't want to go down shorthanded if it's not, you know, you don't want to put yourself down um, a guy if it's a close play. So I think pe- the coaches are going to be need a more definitive look before they make a decision on, on challenges. I like it. I think it's going to cut back, you know, the borderline ones that you can't really tell one way or the other, which were challenged so many times last year. It was almost annoying. I felt like it was once a game. And you're looking at this replay over and over, and you can't even tell because it was so close, but it's getting challenged anyway. So a little little extra, you know, do I want to challenge this or not? Do I want to put my team down? You know, a guy have to kill off a penalty? I mean, it's going to make a difference um, during regulation for sure. Obviously, over time, you have nothing to lose because if someone scores a goal on and off sides, you lose, so you might as well challenge it anyway and maybe get it overturned. And, I mean, that's the case where if you lose in overtime, you think it's offsides, you're challenging it anyway because the goal comes back and you take your chance of killing that penalty. But, I mean, it's I think it's going to cut back a lot. Um in you know regulation and i think that's a good thing uh like i said too many times last year it was just i'm challenging this if it's close and you couldn't really tell one way or the other and it was just a big waste of time yeah that's a that's a good point because um you bring in um so many times during um during the nhl it was basically a five minute timeout i'm pretty sure that's what a lot of coaches were doing they're like oh let's just challenge the play it's relatively close so we can challenge the play we're going to lose our timeout anyway, but it's a long timeout. That's the whole point of our timeout. Right, right. Um, so I can understand that. Yeah, that's a that's a very valid point. Um, yeah, there's uh, – the, the other thing is um, that I think actually is good about this rule is it doesn't affect – because you can um, – the rule for challenging goaltender interference still applies. So 
you still lose a timeout if you right. if you challenge goaltender interference. So this allows people who decide I want to challenge offsides, but there's still goaltender interference that happens later in the game. They can still challenge goalie interference on a major play or something like that. Right, like I said, it's I think it's going to cut back a lot um, during regulation time because I mean you don't want to have to kill off that penalty in a crucial time if you're not 100% certain that it's going to be mm-hmm. overturned. Obviously, an overtime doesn't matter because it's either not a goal or it's a goal and the game's over, so it's not, not going to make a difference, and you'll probably see a lot of them in overtime if that's the case. Um, probably more in the playoffs because in three-on-three, three, I'm not, I mean, offside. Yeah. Sometimes you score so quick that, I mean, there's not really even a lot of offsides going on because it's just so so open. But mm-hmm. it has actually happened a couple of days ago in the uh, Blackhawks-Red Wings game. Was, I saw it for the first time. Uh, Blackhawks scored a goal. Um, Detroit challenged it for offsides. The refs determined that it wasn't offsides, and then they went down. Uh, God, they had to kill off the penalty. So, yeah, it was actually cool to kind of see it for the first time. Um, I like I said, I liked the rule. It was just approved like a couple days ago, like it mm-hmm. like mid preseason. So it was kind of odd. Um, but uh, yeah, like I said, I like it. Yeah, um, a couple other rules for uh, that will be enforced. Um, they're going to be enforcing faceoff ruling. Um, so basically your feet have to be outside that or in that ex- designated area for your skates to be in, um, which I think, um, uh, is good. Um, then they have, they have some other, you know, minor rule changes and things of that sort, but this is the biggest one, quite honestly, because it affects, it not only affects how the game is played, but it also affects how the coaches run their teams. Right. Um, do you think coaches are going to be mad at this rule, or do you think they're going to be just they're going to be indifferent and just be more cautious? I think they're just going to be more cautious. Yeah, like I said, you're not going to want to you're going to want to be 100 percent certain before you take the risk of having to kill off a penalty. So I think it's just going to be take an extra look at it, be be positive. I don't think anybody's going to really be upset over it. Okay, interesting. Um. Let's talk about the Vegas Golden Knights, shall we? Oh <laughs> goodness! <laughs> uh, lots of lots of uh, feelings about the Vegas yes. Golden Knights. Uh, today we're going to be talking about their their design and their colors. Um, so the Vegas Golden Knights. Do you like their design? Yes or no? Let's start with you, Alicia. Okay. Hi. Welcome to what not to wear. Um, <laughs> I like their color scheme, I guess. It's, it's all right. Um, I would imagine a little something more tackier for Vegas. Um, but the color scheme isn't that bad. The logo, I am not a fan of. I feel like it really doesn't represent the Las Vegas area. There's this weird pattern going on the sleeve with the tan. And it just kind of looks like, I don't know, what's, it looks like fur of a camel or something. Or prince of the desert yeah. sand i don't know i'm not a fan of it um i don't know the colors kind of remind me of pittsburgh a little bit and then you get the little red tommy what do you think they're terrible they could have done <laughs> they could have done so much better um starting with i know we're talking about the uniforms we're just starting with like the name like you could have picked a name that like represented vegas yeah you know there's so many choices when you're talking about vegas that you could have picked a name and designed a logo and like the spades ski- right exactly huh. um so but getting to the uniforms they're awful that dark gray home uniform is terrible i don't know what yeah. they were going with there i don't like vegas gold so right yeah. up, i mean i think that's a color you have to include but i don't like the color so that's kind of yeah. where it goes down for me um the red is all right i just don't even think that really matches the dark gray the, the vegas gold and the red i don't even think that's that great of a match to be honest with you and then like the white gloves, like what? I don't even. They actually <laughs> changed that to oh, black gloves, oh, but it's still ugly. Okay, oh. I I completely miss it. So no, no, they, they did it like last week. So okay, you're good. so when they originally came out with uniforms, the gloves were white, and the, yeah, it was just a horrible look. Um, yeah, and then the logo is terrible too. So just all in all, I think that they could have done so much better. Unless they're doing a rot, because they did it with the black jerseys. So unless they're doing like a rotation of like white gloves with white jerseys. Okay. Yeah, they, if they did change it, I missed it. Because yeah, they were originally yeah. white. They were terrible. Um, but all in all, I just they could have done so much better, like from start to finish with this whole thing, than they did. Well, it makes me really nervous because I'm just thinking, have they revealed their mascot yet? If it's going to be some tacky little dragon, <laughs> I'm going to die. If it's like <laughs> one of those like wizard dragons from Blades of Glory. The Islanders are going to sue if that's the case because <laughs> they have Sparky. Um, <sighs> I really don't. Yeah, I, 
I I have so many. First of all, their whole their whole thing was they were trying to go with the Black Knights, and then the U.S. Army was like, "No, you can't do that because we have a thing with that." So immediately, your first thought is, "All right, let's come up with a new mascot altogether." Right? Instead, they decided, "Let's just change it to gold." Like that's no. Uh, my second problem is, again, I'm with you, Tommy. I cannot stand Vegas gold. I couldn't stand it on the Pittsburgh jerseys when they had it. I, I, think, I mean, that's the thing I think they had to include, just, just for the sake of... Yeah, yeah. it's probably because it's Vegas gold, right? right? But I, I really don't like Vegas gold. It's ugly to me. Oh. If you're going to do it, go with, go with like a golden yellow. Yeah. I, that's, yeah. I, I actually, like the new Pittsburgh jerseys, I love yeah, because awesome. yeah. the yellow matches and it looks really really good yeah, it pops with the black yeah right uh vegas gold just doesn't do it for me they did that last minute ad of red when they revealed the jersey or whatever the red stripe not a not really a big fan of it to me it's like a cheap mcdonald's logo ripoff kind of deal where it's the same <laughs> color scheme you know red white and um and gold i i don't really like that um, their logo, I don't have that big of a problem with, actually. Um, I think their logo is actually pretty streamlined. There's no words on it or anything, so I'm pretty good with that. Um, their shoulder patches, I actually don't have a problem with. Those look pretty decent. Yeah, those are pretty cool. Um, I don't like, um, yeah, the the gray. Uh, the dark grays. They should have just gone with black. Yeah. If, if you're going to do it, go with black. Yeah. Um, and they have the dark gray helmets, too. Yeah. Mm. And it it's just like it's so noticeable on the ice, right? That it's just like really, um, their gloves, they should have just I I don't mind people having color in their gloves at all. I love color in the gloves, but if they were gonna do it, they should have just had all black and with like a gold lettering or something like that. Um, just because Vegas gold doesn't to me doesn't look good on the on their gloves. Um, or they could have done what Pittsburgh did and had like a bunch of white all over. Um, yeah, I, I really, and again, they had the white gloves before. My guess is they probably got a ton of backlash Um, from people like, what are you doing? This is hideous. (laughs) Um, maybe the players had something to do with that as well. Um, I really, really just, I don't know. It's, it's interesting. Tommy's going to talk about the Adidas jerseys as a whole. Um, but I wanted to get touch on the Vegas design. Um, just out of curiosity, what would you, what would your mascot be for the Vegas Golden Knights if you had designed the team? Um, maybe like an Elvis impersonator. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fair, fair. Yeah, I, don't, I mean, I'm not very creative, <laughs> so I don't know if I can give you something like on the spot here. But I mean, something that re- like relates to Vegas, something that represents the Vegas culture. I would be yeah, going with that. Easily, you know. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's the first thing I would have thought of was what represents Vegas culture and how can I build my team branding around this? And that's what I would have done. Yeah, like, I don't know, playing cards, something along those lines, yeah. maybe. Spades. Dice. Ooh, maybe like a deck of cards. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that would have been really The tacky. Jokers would have been a better. Ooh. Yeah, I don't know. Guys, why weren't we out there developing this. because we don't we don't work for the NHL. Yeah. I was actually not really a big fan of Vegas getting a team before Quebec. So. It feels like um well, a tourist trap. <laughs> not to not to get too off traffic traffic Sorry. um with, you know, Vegas getting a team before Quebec, but the problem is that you already have 16 teams in the Eastern Conference and 14 teams in the West. So you already had two extra in the East. If you, I mean, obviously True. Quebec would have had to play in fair. the East. Fair so point. you would have been you would have been seventeen fourteen and yeah. I, it doesn't work like that. I hope Seattle gets a team. I think they're. I, I mean, they have to expand to thirty two teams at some point because you can't yeah. you can't have thirty one teams for too long. Right. I think Seattle's a lock. I mean, they just built their they're in the process of building a new arena that'll uh, work for basketball and hockey. I think Seattle gets to that thirty second team, and then as for Quebec, I could see a team like Florida or you know somewhere like that relocating to Quebec. Fair, fair point. Um, all right, let's move on here. Um, so we'll give our, we're going to give our top 10 players and why, um, you guys, we have some time on this, so we can go pretty in depth. Um, and then Tommy, will talk about your jerseys and then because we have some time, we might make some comments, all of us around on that. So let's start off, uh, top 10 players, uh, again, give your reasons and why, um, 
And we'll start with you, Tommy. All right, so actually I took this as um, top 10 players to watch, not top 10 players overall. That's so fine. So I'm, like, who I'm interested, you know, is, is uh, seeing for the year. So, okay, so obviously number one, Connor McDavid, no-brainer. Um, reigning MVP, face the NHL in the next two, three years, without a doubt. Um, so exciting to watch. I, I, did you see the, the goal he scored uh, the other day in the preseason when he was he's flying down the ice and he kind of chipped the puck up? off his stick and then shot it in midair for a goal. It was pretty cool. I did not see that, actually. That, But I could see him doing that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be awesome. Um, number two, Austin Matthews scored 40 goals last year, won the Calder Trophy for Rookie of the Year, facing the Maple Leafs. He's going to be awesome. Um, number three, Sidney Crosby. Um, no explanation needed. Um, four, I had Patrick Kane down, um, one of the most exciting players in the league. Won the MVP two years ago with 46 goals and 106 points. Last year, came back with 34 goals. Um, playing with Artem Anisimov the last two years, but this year it looks like he'll be playing with Nick Schmaltz and possibly Alex Brinkett, which I think will be an awesome combination uh, if that's the case. Um, number five, I'm actually going to stick with the Blackhawks. I'm going to say Jonathan Taves. He had a really down last two years, but Brandon Saad is back, and when the two of them are together, I mean, Taves is one of the best players in the league, um, so I'm really excited to see that. Um, I had Ovechkin at number six. Again, not really an explanation needed, if not the best goal scorer in the league. I think he is the best goal scorer in the league, probably the best goal scorer that we will ever see. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Um, number seven, I had Brent Burns, defenseman, who scored 29 goals last year and had 76 points. That's incredible for a defenseman. Um, I had Bobrovsky at number eight. Uh, Sergei Bobrovsky, the goalie for the uh, Blue Jackets, 41 wins last year. 2.06 goals against average, 9.31 save percentage. For a little bit there, that um, goals against or the uh, yeah the goals against average was like sub two, which is unheard of. Um, he had an outstanding year last year. Um, I want to see if he can repeat it or come close again this year. Um, I had Patrick Line at number nine, scored 36 goals last year on a terrible Jets team. Yeah, if they could just play a little bit better. I'd like to see what he can do with that with a little bit more talent around him. Um, and then to round out my top 10 players to watch for the year, I had uh, Artemi Panarin actually getting traded um, from the Blackhawks to the Blue Jackets in that Brandon Saad trade. Um, back-to-back 30-goal seasons to start his career, but Patrick Kane assisted on, like, almost every single one of those goals, um, and now Patrick Kane is not going to be giving him the puck all game. So I want to see – I think he's a great player, but I want to see if his numbers are the same without Kane as they were with. Um, I think that'll be um, interesting to watch. So that's my top 10. And just a couple honorable mentions, not to get into detail – but I just thought, you know, to bring him up, uh, P.K. Subban, one of the most exciting players in the league. Fair. Um, Nico Heischer, the number one overall pick in last June's draft um, to New Jersey. Um, he made the team. He's going to be playing in the top six. So keep an eye out for that, the number one overall pick. And then Jack Eichel, um, if he could stay healthy, he only played in 61 games last year. But former number two overall pick, um, had 57 points in 61 games last year. So if you put that out over an 82-game season, like, that's almost a point per game. Um, that's really good. That's really solid production. Um, he's one of the most exciting players in the league, but he wasn't able to stay healthy last year, so I'm looking forward to him, you know, being able to play all 82 games this year and, and producing to his capabilities. Well, Tommy, great minds think alike. <laughs> um, number one, I have Connor McDavid. We all know why. He's he's fabulous. Art Ross Trophy, Ted Lindsay Award, Hart Memorial Trophy. Just last season, he's a great leader, and he's really brought a flame to Edmonton. Um, Austin Matthews. Once again, he's been playing with this hunger and tenacity. Even in the preseason, like you know that he is out there to play this year. Sidney Crosby, no explanation for him. Um, I just got to add, as long as he can stay healthy, avoid diving, avoid <laughs> any injury, right. um, I expect a great season from him. He's coming off a high after winning back-to-back cups. Um, Kucherov. He's one of the most productive players in Tampa, and he has this um, he has this great partnership with Stamkos. And last year, he was tied for 85 points, and he had um, his first 40 goal season last year. Um, Jamie Ben, captain of Dallas, um, they're really making moves in Dallas. They were 15 points away from making the playoffs last year. They're really trying to figure out that chemistry, and I'm looking forward to seeing what they can do in Dallas this year. Um, he's had 324 points since um, 2013. Um, Patrick Kane. Um, the one big thing with the Blackhawks this year is finding that chemistry with adding all these fabulous new players onto their team. 
I feel like they're kind of starting to feel that chemistry maybe last year, but with losing like Panarin to Columbus and getting all these other guys, it's figuring out how that is going to mesh this year. Um, Evgeny Malkin, three-time Stanley Cup champ. We all know he can shoot. Um, Alex Ovechkin, once again, is not even needed to explain why. He produced 33 goals last year, but um, the team is looking for more. They're looking for that old classic Ovi, and um, he's been actually doing a lot more running in the preseason and just getting really healthy this summer and losing a couple pounds, and he is skating so much quicker and easier. So I'm really excited to see what that small difference is going to make in his playing this year. Um, Terencinko, um, he has the potential to be one of the best scorers in the league. Um, but the thing with him is it's like he makes it rain with goals and then he'll go on a little drought and then he'll make it storm and rain with goals. Um, so I put Jack Eichel as a number 10. Um, like he said, 57 points within 61 games. If he stays healthy this year, just imagine what he's going to continually do in those 82 games. Yeah, that's uh, you guys got some good lists there. Um, I'll give my list here in a second, but I want to make some comments first. Um, yeah, it's interesting because I thought this list was hard to make. It was very hard to make, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, it's top ten players to watch this year. I mean, I came up with like thirty off the top of my head. Right. Narrow down. Mm-hmm. So yeah, and you can pick you can pick players from pretty much any team. Yeah. Um, and I I really don't think that's, you know, and uh, of course, you know, my goal is to try as be an unbiased as possible when making this list, right? I could list an entire team if I wanted to, but um, I'm not going to, and um, this this list was really hard. Um, it's interesting you brought up Jamie Ben. I didn't actually think of Jamie Ben. Yeah. Uh, I probably would have thought of Tyler Sagan beforehand, but that's a good that's a good pick as well. Um, yeah. There's a whole bunch of good players that you guys picked. Um, that's a good list. Uh, Bobrovsky, I thought was a good pick as yeah. well. Yeah. Um, I'm interested to see what happens with him and Panarin. Um, I actually think Panarin will be okay. I I do mm-hmm. too. I think it'll be. I, I don't I don't want to say he'll struggle, but I think he'll be looking for someone like Kane to get him the puck like right away. Whereas he's gonna co- need to be the guy on the puck more this year. You know, making the plays. Whereas last year and the year before, you would kind of just pull up at the circle and wait for Kane to get him the puck, and he'd yeah. one time it, you know. And I think he's just gonna have to do more with the puck mm-hmm. in Columbus now. He's gonna have to be a little bit more aggressive of making his own plays, I think, instead of having it handed right. to him. Right. Um, I feel like with a team like Columbus, he will have a lot of great opportunities to step up and do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he. Uh, I think the biggest change from Columbus to uh, from Chicago to the Columbus is um, Chicago is a lot more like fast paced. Uh, fast break kind of team and um, Columbus is more of a settle down sit in your offense and you know set up your plays kind of um, a team and so I think that Columbus will be a completely different setup than what he was used to with uh, Kane you know giving him a puck on a fast break for a one-timer and um, so that's because that's what Brandon Saad really struggled with I think that's why he struggled in Columbus is that He's not a make-your-own-play kind of guy. He's the Mm -hmm. guy that's going to go drive the net, make the plays in the corners, create space for the other guys. Yeah, that's exactly it. So, um, yeah, that's an interesting uh, – it'll be interesting to see how he ends up turning out. Um, Also, Patrick Laine, good good choice. I actually didn't think to put him on this list, but – easily a player you could obviously put on this list. I think he'll he'll play well this year on a Winnipeg Jets team that's going to really struggle now that <laughs> you know with <laughs> goaltender issues. Yeah. Um so yeah, that's a that's a good that's a good pick as well. Um there's so many players I could pick from, quite honestly. Um I'll give you my list here. So I think we were all in agreement that the first the first two players. Mine was Connor McDavid for number 1. Um you guys hit on it. I really don't see a reason why we really need to explain Connor McDavid. Yeah. If you haven't watched him, go watch him. Just go watch highlights for one year, and you'll see why why we say watch Connor McDavid. Um, I think he single handedly carried. Well, 
I shouldn't say. He <laughs> he pretty much helped the Oilers get to the playoffs last year. So he pretty much carried the team on his back. Pretty Is much. Is that what you're yeah. saying? <laughs> yeah. I, I don't want to say, like, I, I mean, uh, there were other players involved, too. Yeah, it's but, not like he's the only piece there, but, yeah. I mean, without him, they don't go to the playoffs. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, Connor McDavid, um, out, outstanding in terms of skill. Um, Austin Matthews, number two. Um, I think he's my favorite American player who is under the age of 30 to watch. Um, and I think he'll be outstanding. Um, I heard someone say one time he's a combination of Jonathan Taves and Patrick Kane in one person. Um, and I think that's a pretty accurate description of him. Um, he's makes outstanding passing plays and, um, and he sets himself up well for good shooting opportunities. And both Kane and Taves can do that, but just with his play style, how he plays. He's a outstanding player. I'm excited to see him with the Toronto Maple Leafs and how that pans out. I would love to see him get a Stanley Cup in Toronto, um, or just in general, actually. Um, him and Mitch Marner and all those young guys. Nylander, yeah. Yeah, and Nylander as well. Yeah, it's going to be... It'll be interesting to watch Toronto, but he's definitely one of the key players to watch, I think, in Toronto. Number three, I had Jonathan Taves. Um, I last, last year, I thought his biggest struggle was with goal scoring, but I thought he actually played relatively decent in all the other areas. Um, he just struggled with goal scoring, just with how the lines were set up and everything. It was hurt for a while too. It didn't. Help. Yeah, that doesn't help as well. Um, but when he was when he was playing, I didn't really, I didn't see. And it. He went through that stretch we talked about last year in like uh, March, where he was just on a tear. Um, yeah. So yeah, I mean, he'll, he'll be fine. Yeah, um, and again, with, like you said, with Brandon Sod coming back, Patrick Sharp coming back as well. Yep. Um, some of the returning uh, line or um, teammates, I should say. Um, it'll be interesting to see him. I think he does get rejuvenated, as as you say, um, and he becomes the center that everyone is scared to play. Um, number four, Shea Weber. Um, I think Shea Weber gets overlooked a lot, um, especially with his long career in Nashville. Um, I really don't see a reason why... Um, because he's one of the best defensive defensemen in the league, and he's got the hardest shot. Now he's in Montreal, obviously. Um, I It'll be interesting to see how he plays his second year in Montreal. Um, without, you know, Subban, they kind of had to adjust how the defensemen played. And I think Shea Weber is a great leader um, as, a, as a player, and I could see him helping out the Montreal Canadiens and how they play much, much better um, this season. Um, number five, Carey Price. Um, there's a lot of argument as to if he's the best goaltender in the world, and I think it's a there's a pretty solid argument to say so. I would say so currently. He's the best goaltender in the league for sure and in the world. Um, he's, he's outstanding. Um, he's just been on a team that has not been able to um, have offensive production to help out the defense and um, has been had injury problems. I think that's the biggest thing. But otherwise, he's been a pretty solid goaltender when he's healthy, and I'm excited to see him play this year. Uh, number six, Drew Doughty. Um, one of my favorite defensemen to watch, quite honestly. Um, he's he's aggressive. I he He... There's times where I'm like, that's a little overboard, but um, he's one of the best defense. And I remember watching him when he played with uh, the Kings when they first won the cup. And um, he was outstanding. And then again, when they played the Rangers in uh, 2014. Um, and he was, he. I hated watching him play against my Rangers, but he, he did his job and he played the role perfectly um outstanding defenseman um i'm excited to see him play number seven uh henrik lundquist um he's on the older side um so he's not in his prime but 
it'll be interesting to see him play and how he reacts to his age as a goaltender. Last year, he had a pretty decent season, uh, and a lot of people thought he wouldn't. Um, and so I'm excited to see how he turns out. Number eight, Duncan Keith. Um, there's, again, the Chicago version of Drew Doughty, in my opinion. Um, outstanding defenseman. Um, a little bit more calm and collected than Drew Doughty. Um, you watch some of his highlights online and you just go, wow, did he just make that play? Um, and, you know, one of the reasons they won in 2015, um, uh, uman- unanimous um, uh, MVP of the playoffs um, from the NHL um, for that. Yeah, he never left the ice. I mean, yeah. they, they won the Stanley Cup with four defensemen, and I, I feel like he never left the ice. His average play time was ridiculous yeah. in the playoffs. It was, and they had what? They had two lines of defensemen? Basically. I mean, yeah. it was Keith Seabrook, Jalmerson, and Oduya, and then occasionally they'd rotate in, like, team and in or commit yeah. or something like that. I mean, it was, they barely, I mean, any late game situation, they were staple of the bench. So it was literally just those four. Keith and uh, Jalmerson would get off, Seabrook. And uh, yeah. how do you would hop on and it was just yeah yeah it's he's he's outstanding to watch as a you know you hate playing against him but he's outstanding to watch as a as a whole number nine uh Patrick Kane um best east west forward um <laughs> I heard it said in the in the World Cup that coaches just say we just turn away when he gets the puck because it annoys <laughs> them when how he uh plays east west but um he's so good that the coaches can't not have him you know um uh, he's outstanding with his stick handling um shots wise i don't see um any reason why he shouldn't be getting at least 30 goals um and now with new line mates i think he should be he should be playing a lot better um great player um Maybe getting on the older side a little bit, but I still think he's outstanding. He's got good speed to him, good size. Um, yeah, it'll be interesting to watch him play as always. Uh, my last player is Ryan Getzloff for the Anaheim Ducks. Um, mostly for his leadership, I think, on the ice. Um, his play is a little bit you know, sporadic at times, but I think leadership-wise is the thing I would watch for with uh, Ryan Getzloff. Um, honorable mentions, um, I want to throw in, uh, Eric Carlson into that mix. Um, reason I didn't put him on this list is because he'll be out for a while. Um, but when he does, uh, come back from his, um, recovery, um, Eric Carlson will be a player I will definitely watch. Um, uh, Tyler Sagan, I would probably throw into that mix as well. Um, and then probably my last player that I would probably throw in would be, um, Matt Zuccarello, um, outstanding playmaker. Not a, not a whole lot that needs to be said there. Um, that was my list. So if you guys want to make comments, we got time. Do you guys want to talk about that, or do we, should we just move on? I think we should um, rant a little bit more about Las Vegas. You want to rant a little bit more yeah. Las, about Las Vegas? Yeah. Well, I want to hear about Tommy's hot take. Yeah. All right, Tommy, let's let's hear your hot take on these new Adidas jerseys. Yeah, so I almost talked about it last week, but I uh, picked the salary cap instead. So this week we're going to go with Adidas. So I was kind of hoping, you know, for the most part, Adidas to keep everything relatively the same. And in some cases, in some teams, they did do that. But other teams, they made some terrible changes. And I think some teams, they made some decent changes. So it was just all in all, like, I don't think they had a clear, like, idea of what they were going for. Because some teams got drastically changed, some teams not at all, and some just some dumb changes. Um... So, for example, I'll start with the Blackhawks. Like, the collar on their red jersey now is, like, almost all white, and it just pops out. It looks terrible. It's dumb. I don't know what they were doing. Um, the Predators and the Devils jerseys are so plain, especially the Predators is literally just yellow and almost nothing else <laughs> on it. It looks like that you'd buy it at Target for, like, 20 bucks. And, like, <laughs> it, I, it's just so – there's not – and I'm a big fan of, like, plain, simple uniform right. styles. This is just way too plain. Them and the Devils. The Wild got, like, a complete revamp, and it is disgusting. It is so bad. Um, we touched on Vegas and how I can't stand anything about their uniforms. Um, and then the Bruins, you, I don't know if you guys noticed, they got rid of the yellow socks. They now have black socks. Oh, really? Uh, and oh. I'm not a fan of that at all. I don't think it's a good look. Um, 
Yeah. I, mean, I don't know. I don't. I don't know why. I mean, if Adidas wanted to go into this and make changes, that's fine. Um, to change original six designs, I don't. I don't understand it at all. I think they're just, nope. just going to kept the same. Um, like I said, I do think there were some good changes. For example, the flames and the avalanche, I think, improved a lot. They went mm-hmm. from like really overcomplicated, like striping and piping and all that down the jersey. They're just a real simple looks. So that was good. My biggest complaint with Adidas is like I just don't think they had a clear focus when they were going into this, and they made some bad changes, and just some of them were just way too boring. So I, I just think that they could have maybe done a little bit better of a job overall. Alicia, what's your take on the jerseys? <sighs> like when just even reading about the changes on the jerseys, it sounded like one of those god awful infomercials, like <laughs> lightweight, breathable. The, like it's no longer like stitched it's just the logo there like lightweight you can you can play hockey in it for hours I'm like okay guys I just want to buy a jersey that looks nice yeah and they clearly didn't do an amazing job on doing that um I like the way that Pittsburgh's looks now um Tommy pretty much hit it with the designs. I was thinking the same things when I saw all the others. Like, my big thing, like what you said with the Bruins, is how can you change, like, one of the original sixes, like, look? Like, Mm -hmm. it's a classic staple look. Like, it's been this way for how many years now? And Adidas wants to walk all up in there and be like, nope. Yeah. Bye. (laughs) So... That's how I feel about that. Yeah, I think my biggest complaint though is just some got these drastic changes and others just mm-hmm. weren't touched. I just I think one or the other. And I don't I think they should just kept everyone relatively the same. But some did get better, so I guess that's good. But uh, quite honestly, I thought they should have just changed the material and put the Adidas logo on it. They yeah, own that, Reebok. Yeah, it's that's essentially that's what I was thinking that they were gonna do going in. I mean, you kept reading like no real major changes. I mean, they said like a couple teams would have big changes, which is to be expected because even when Reebok was there, some teams went over right. some major changes. Um, and then like this year too, with no alternate jerseys because they just want to focus on selling the the home in a way, you know, with the Adidas branding. But yeah, I, I love the alternative jerseys. Like it's saying new, refreshing. Like yeah, I don't, I don't know. I I agree. Like it was just either hit or miss. They with, just didn't have a direction. I think that's my yes. biggest point. Yeah, and I think honestly, they kind of just said teams make your own jerseys. I felt like that's what they did. Cuz you <laughs> like uh for example, um the Tampa Bay Lightning just got rid of the collar and stuff like that. And I was like, "Why?" Um it's it's it looked better with the collar. And then some teams had the the ties, uh, the the laces on their right. jersey. And they got rid of that. Some teams got rid of it. Some teams kept it. Um, also, the way they decided to do the lacing this year, it's basically just stitched onto the jersey, which is weird to me. There's no holes or anything. Oh. Um, I actually don't like how the NHL logo up here isn't, like, encompassed by the collar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that was my biggest complaint because it, it's really noticeable on some teams. For example, the New York Rangers because they just have a big, giant red diamond right here. And I'm right. it, when I saw that, I went, whoa. <laughs> um, some teams have uh, no changes pretty much at all. Um, I know um, the Anaheim Ducks basically have no changes, um, although they do have that weird – orange half collar in the back which i was not sure why if you're gonna do it just do the full collar Mm -hmm. um san jose really really didn't make any changes at all and i'm actually don't have any complaints about their jersey i agree about the the blackhawks jersey though i saw it and i went i was just like why did you get rid of the collar that was my biggest complaint with chicago biased opinion they have the best uniform best logo in sports yeah, just, le- just change, just put the take the Reebok logo off the back, put the Adidas logo on the back, call it a day. Yeah, and yes. they just screwed with the collar. Like the, literally, the only thing they changed was the collar. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, whatever. Yeah, I'm questioning just why the switch to Adidas. Uh, Adidas owns Reebok. Like, is Adidas trying to get rid of Reebok? N- that, that may be a completely different topic, but no, it's a it's a fair comment. Um, last time I when I heard about it. Um, from what I heard, Adidas w- told Reebok, we want you to focus on these specific areas. Oh. And the funny thing is they own CCM. Oh. And CCM made the original jerseys before yeah. Reebok did. Right. And 
they told CCM stick to hockey equipment. And I, uh, you know, it's kind of one of those things where you're just like, why didn't you just tell CCM to make the jersey? Yeah, but at the same thing, at the same time, like when has Adidas ever like truly cared about hockey, like Adidas the brand as a whole? Yeah. Like, keep it within CCM or or stick to Reebok. Reebok. Yeah. Like, guys, common sense. It's just they want their their they money and money, their marketing. Yeah. The one thing I I will give Adidas props for is they did not do that stupid three stripe thing down the side of the jersey that they did in the World Cup. I was so afraid that they were going to do that to all the jerseys. Yeah, I was it, when I I was like, "Oh no, please don't do that, especially to the original six teams because I would have been so angry." Yeah. Um, do you guys know if they're doing um like women or like female jerseys for like fans? Uh, yeah, I think they I I haven't checked that out yet, I but would I would assume yeah. As long as they don't make them frilly and prilly, no, I think I'm all I good. Think just cut differently. Okay. Yeah, I'm not. I'm because the cut of the Reebok ones are female. They're a tad ridiculous, like versus a normal jersey. Ladies, if you're watching, just don't even invest in a female like size jersey. Just get the real jersey. Fair, fair. Yeah. Um, last thing before we head out, are you gonna get an Adidas jersey anytime soon? No, I just bought um, a new Patrick Kane jersey like two years ago, so I invested my money in that, and we're good to go. <laughs> Fair. Well, I'll probably just invest in a clearance um, Stanley Cup jersey because they're switching brands, so yeah, should probably go on clearance anytime soon. They've Hopefully. been on clearance for a while, actually. Yeah, yeah after the Brandon Sod trade, the official Blackhawk store um, was selling Reebok Brandon Sod jerseys for ninety bucks. I mean, oh, they're that's normally nice. like, they're normally like. To over two hundred bucks, yeah. and that was for ninety. So yeah, I got an unnamed uh, Ducks jersey for fifty ish, um, just the logo. Solid. Um, but uh, it's unnamed, so. But yeah, those ran for like a hundred and ten, I think, when yeah. I bought it. I mean, I, I just bought a new patch King jersey two years ago. Um, the only big change is the collar. Yeah. I, not like any drastic change. I'll stick to I'll stick to my Reebok jersey. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not gonna go out and buy a new jersey anytime soon. I have my Henrik Lundqvist jersey and then my Timu Solani jersey, which they're not gonna make the old Anaheim Mighty Ducks jersey anytime soon. So I don't have to worry about that. But the Henrik Lundqvist jersey, that's not getting thrown mm-hmm. out for an Adidas jersey by any stretch of the imagination. All right. Well, that is our show for those of you watching. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed. Uh, little bit different set of topics uh i would say um preseason is about to end here and um because of that um topics are a little tight um for for this but once regular season starts uh which will be this upcoming week actually yeah Yeah. wednesday uh please tune in we got some good games coming up um yeah go to nbc sports network or go watch it on your NHL app or whatever you watch it on. Um, but yeah, so, uh, I hope you guys enjoyed, uh, please tune in. Um, we do this every, um, every Saturday morning, uh, from 11 to 12. Um, if we don't get off to a rough start with, uh, technology (laughs) issues. Um, but we go from 11 to 12, usually go about an hour. Um, we stream on YouTube and Twitch. Um, so if you want to go and watch us, feel free to do that. Um, it's Cardinal Sports Live, um, and yeah, you can obviously go watch us there. Uh, if you want to see the video, uh, if you're listening to this and you're like, oh, I want to watch the video, um, we put the videos up uh, later in the week. Um, they get edited and put out, so you can actually watch us talk about it if you w- would rather see us talk. So um, yeah, um, that being said, leave a like, comment, and subscribe. Um, And we'll see you guys next week. Bye.